I think if we, we look at our history, at least I look at mine, and I wonder the moments when I got the angriest. And, uh, you know, I think about different moments in my own life. And I almost if I looked at my life in terms of the history of anger, <laughs> it'd be quite an interesting case study. Um, I remember the first time I got angry, and I think it was my first sin, was like when I was five or six years old. And um, my, uh, somebody had given me Lincoln Logs. And I was at Beverly Road, one of our houses, at our house there. And, uh, you know, it was a birthday party and all that. And I opened up all these different gifts. Probably, I don't remember how many, but anyway, I opened up these Lincoln Logs, left them, and I went opening others. Well, lo and behold, uh, one of my relatives, uh, he opened that gift up and started to build with the Lincoln Logs. And so I was over doing whatever, maybe blew out the cake and noticed that he was building Lincoln Logs with my Lincoln Logs without me. And so I went over and I just booted those Lincoln Logs as hard and as fast as I could. And he like looked up and then I remember, you know, obviously my parents weren't too happy about that. But I remember how angry I was because I wanted control. Those were like my Lincoln Logs. Those weren't his. You know what I mean? And, and so it was like this rage of like interiorly, I was like, damn. And then it wasn't just like, damn, then it was like a word of like, damn it, that's going on. And then damn you, my uncle who, who was playing it. And then boom, you know, and, and see, these are the three levels of anger that the Lord's ask is, is challenging us on. It's not enough just to say, I'm good because I don't shoot somebody or kill them. That's obviously a, a level that um, we all should be easily attaining in holiness. I think we can agree to that. But then within these levels of anger, the Lord's really challenging us to say, okay, at the very least, when you are angry, just say damn inside, right? Instead of like damning the person and then actions, right? So there's three levels of, of anger. One is like inside saying damn. The other is the, you know, the action or the other is like, yeah, the action of like damn it. And then the other is damning the person. It's a lot of damn going on here, you know? Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you are with what, you know, when you look at some different moments of anger in your life. But uh, Tim Gray would reflect from the Augustine Institute that many times when we get angry, it's because we want control. So we get angry at a spouse or a friend or a child. Why? Because they don't do what we want them to do. In my case, my relative, like how dare he play with my Lincoln locks. And then I think everybody can kind of apply this in their own way. So it's good. You know, maybe next time we go to confession, they pick up this gospel and like, yeah, work through it. The word raka is a tough word. It really just means damn, <laughs> you know, and it's not damning a specific person. It's just saying damn to the specific like thing going on. Right. And then the, the next level would be like, yeah, really wanting that person that's doing that to be damned. Now, I don't think at five years old, I wanted to condemn my relative, but I think you get the idea, you know, but I often wonder, is anger ever justified? Now, I don't pretend to know the answer to that question, nor do I pretend to say that I could be like Jesus going into the temple. The classic example of anger being justified is Jesus going into the temple and knocking down the money changers, right? So if you can get to that level of holiness and understand in Jesus's human nature, how his anger was aligned with God's divine plan, there's your answer. I obviously... I wish I could attain that. But I, I, I think there could be something around justified anger. When a Catholic institution proposes to be Catholic, and in return, what you get is not Catholic. So I would imagine, I, I don't know this for certain, but if you applied to Brigham Young University, you're going to get Mormon religious philosophy. And you won't feel like you got like anything like bamboozled or like that was unjust. It's like you applied to go there to get Mormon philosophy or their religion, right? And that's what you would expect. If you buy a Volvo, you expect to, well, get a Volvo, right? 
But it seems like in our Catholic world, when you apply to a Catholic university, what you get is anything but Catholic. You don't see Eucharistic adoration being encouraged for our children. You don't see the reading of scripture and St. Augustine. You don't see the, the study of the catechism. You certainly do not see Jesus Christ mentioned as the divine savior from our sins and, and confession being encouraged. In fact, what you get is what I heard last night, this dear girl who just graduated from a local Catholic college and she had to, as she entered into that Catholic college, she thought this is gonna be great. You know, I'd study, she, was, she went to Olsh and she, she knew her faith and she's like, great, now we're gonna get to study Augustine and Aquinas and go to these next levels of our faith. And she was so excited and she walks into one of her classrooms and they say, you're a white woman, therefore you have privilege. So this whole class is gonna be about why your privilege is enslaving the rest of the, of the class. And at the end, an African-American guy came up to him and said, you can't get an A in this class because you don't have my skin color. And this dear girl, like, she just wanted to, you know, grow her faith by going to a Catholic institution of, of that type of nature. And, and this is, she just, like, got completely, like, derailed by that. And, 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 you know, there was never any sense of, like, hey, you know, let's pray or let's do that. It was just all about this kind of social engineering that needed to happen rather than the Holy Spirit truly inspiring the leadership, the faculty, and the students to have a deeper relationship with God. And for me, I mean, that's, that's one of the greatest, you know, bamboozling going on today. Like I remember I was at a, a university in Washington, DC when I was in a seminarian and Protestants would sign up to go to this prominent university in Washington, DC. You know why? Because they knew that the Catholic theological tradition was so rich, they wanted plugged into it. They wanted to understand Jerome and Augustine and Aquinas. They wanted to understand the theology of the body. And they were Protestant, they weren't even Catholic. And you know, so you know what happened to them? They went to this university and they realized that the university faculty and stuff like that was completely confused and weren't, weren't at all teaching anything that had to do with the Catholic church or any of the traditions. And it was just at that time that St. John Paul II would produce what's called ex cordia ecclesia, which means from the heart of the church. And St. John Paul II saw this and he called out these Catholic institutions that had sold their soul to the devil or other social things instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to, to be that intellectual giant that the Catholic church is supposed to be in our universities. And he, he, he published this document called Ex Cordia Ecclesia. And you know what the document said, basically, Ex Cordia Ecclesia? That this is St. John Paul II inviting Catholic institutions, especially Catholic universities in the United States. He just basically said, if you teach theology in a Catholic university, just make sure it's Catholic. Now, I know that sounds crazy. Don't kill me for saying that, right? Like, geez, you are so like enslaving. Like, my goodness, your mind. Aren't you open and free thinking? It's, no, no kid is forced to go to a Catholic university. But if you pay for a Catholic university, I think you have a right to receive Catholic teaching. And anything but that is going on in so many of our Catholic universities. And you wonder why our church is where it is today, why our society is where it is today. The moral fabric, the theological way in which God reveals himself to young people, to leadership in our universities is being blockaded. And so for me, one of the deeper questions is where can we truly direct and how can we? direct just anger. Maybe not at a specific person or figurehead, but at the work of this blockade. And I tell you what, when I was talking to this young girl last night, she had just graduated from one of these institutions. You could see how deflated she was. She had this hope, this dream, that the four years at this university we're going to put her on a level so that she could be the woman that she's wanted to be and, and go into, I think she's going to become like a chiropractor or something. And at the same time, the imam and all these wonderful dreams that she had. And it's not just that that Catholic institution punctured it. It just it blockaded her growth. It stunted her growth. 
But deeper down than that, it's a manipulation. It's using the name, we're a Catholic university, to undermine the very mission of the Catholic Church. And that's where I think, for me, oof, I wonder how Judgment Day will go for those who led that. So let us pray today that, you know, maybe we can look at our own history of, of anger, raka, and pray, God, that we can give that over to him, but we never lose that sense of our identity, who we are, whose we are, and therefore be able to call out what we need with great courage. That's what all the great saints did. That's what we're called to do. And boy, today, if you can't see that, that's like seeing that the Pittsburgh Pirates are gonna win the World Series this year, you know? If they can't touch first base when they hit a home run, or the guy who catches the ball who's supposed to just tag the, just tag the base at first, I think they'll win a World Series or go to a World Series before 2030, but not gonna be this year. And we have to see that that's exactly what's going on in our Catholic universities. We're pretending like we're a Catholic university. We're pretending that we actually have a baseball team, but really what's going on is what we should be angry about. Our kids, our future, and our institutions that are supposedly Catholic need to be called out for that. So let us pray today that we too can pray for that, sacrifice for that. And if we ever have a chance to truly be rebels with the cause of Christ for the freedom that's so needed to be able to hear the truth of Jesus Christ in our universities.